Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. James McCann. He's Professor Emeritus of History at Boston University. His research and teaching interests include agricultural and ecological history of Africa, Ethiopia, and the Horn of Africa, field research methods in African studies, the ag agroecology of tropical disease, and the history of food slash cuisine in Africa and the Atlantic world. And today we're going to focus mostly on his book, Maze and Grace, A History of Africa's Encounter with the New World Crop. So Dr. McCann, welcome to the show. It's a huge pleasure to everyone. Thank you for your invitation. So uh, let's start, I guess, at the beginning. So uh, we're going to talk about maize here today. Where did maize originate from? Maize is a new world crop that was um, domesticated by peoples in Mesoamerica. And it's difficult. We don't know the exact progenitor, the first example of something we would call maize in the common term, but there are examples of, of um, archaeological evidence of, for example, the Bat Cave, where they found something that looks a bit like maize, mm -hmm. that has it on, a, on an ear with a, with a cob. Um, right. And the evolution is the experimentation by local farmers. We don't know, men and women both were involved, probably, but we don't really know that. Mesoamerica. But the characteristics that were evolved over time was farmer selection of certain characteristics they wanted to have available in their own diets and their own food. And maize is remarkable in its spread internationally. That's why my interest in the arrival of maize and its propagation in Africa, it, it's about farmer, household, local knowledge, only to some degree about elite applications. So it's the earliest history. We don't really know for sure but the spread from Mesoamerica into North America. And as far as New England, and for example, this is an exa example of a New England flint. Mm -hmm. And eight rows. And it's not something commercially viable, but it represents the kind of movement of, of, of maize into new environments. This other example here, you see, this looks like what Columbus would have brought with him. He brought maize back from the Caribbean, a Caribbean red flint, which is this one, um, to Europe. And he sent it to his friends in different places, in Germany and Italy and Spain. And it began to be experimented with and eventually was taken over by farmers themselves who were the key innovators, both in Africa and in Europe, when maize spread as this popular crop that had certain characteristics that were overwhelmingly popular with farmers as they sought to both be commercial, but also to feed their local populations. And what are some of those characteristics? What are the most distinct traits of maize? Maize is one, it is wind pollinated. In other, it's not pollinated by insects or by, um, by other means. And on a maize plant, you have both male and female parts of the plant. So it can self-pollinate, but for the most part, the wind moves the pollen between fields, and between plants. So you get automatically a mix, genetic mixing that gives you a final result of texture, color, and the characteristics, characteristics of the plant itself. So it has this characteristic that farmers have, have, have the ability to control it by, by hand moving the pollen uh, so that they have characteristics that they favor, whether it's color or texture, or for example, how long it stores. Uh, some varieties of maize do not store very long at all. You have to consume them or they go bad. Other ones will last longer. And so farmers are making these choices over generations. What the end result is you find the difference between these two. I would say it's all about the farmer choices uh, not elite scientists, the farmer choices at the early level and the popularity of it as it spread around the world was because it was controllable, along with other New World um, additions like capsicum, pepper. Mm -hmm. We can't recognize world cuisines without recognizing the contribution of pepper, capsicum, okay. uh, in 
Indian, Indian, Ethiopian, all varieties of tastes that we value coming from those new world exchanges with new world, yeah. And uh, what are some of the ways maize differs from other uh, common crops? Well, as I said, the wind pollination factor is something that farmers have to learn to control all the way to Monsanto suing farmers for the pollen being carried by the wind across fields in Iowa mm -hmm. um, or, or elsewhere where the control of the pollen is a key issue about how do you make it commercially viable. Um, right. But the, the difference between something like wheat, wheat is, wheat is self-pollinating. It doesn't, the pollen does not move more than a few microns from different parts of the plant. Rice is, is self-pollinating. Uh, so maize is distinctive and it is wind pollinated, not insect pollinated. And that makes a huge difference. But farmers understood this pretty quickly. When any place where we see where maize has become adapted as a, ma the, a major crop, you see that farmers are adjusting their own knowledge systems to the characteristics of maize. Maize is a hermaphrodite. It represents both genders on the same crop, but it also is, uh, I guess, morally un un unquestioning about sharing sexual <laughs> engagements. Right. And so, I mean, we're also going to talk about how maize spread across the globe and specifically uh, in Africa. Uh, but what are are there specific ecological conditions where maize produces high, higher yields, where it goes, grows and is farmed the best? Well, of course, that's a key characteristic. And when maize came from Either directly, for example, from from the Atlantic trade with Brazil, yeah, and the trade, the Atlantic trade, of course, has is a complex interaction of sugar and human labor, horse labor, you know, slaves um, going across and carrying maize as a potential crop brought into in the African case into West Africa, later into Southern Africa, but also mm -hmm. up the Nile and into the Indian Ocean world. Where the word the the Kiswahili word for maize is muhindi, it's mm -hmm. from India. It doesn't come didn't come from India, but the the understanding the popular understanding of where this thing came from became the name. If we look at the name for maize in different cultures, different languages, we learn a lot about people's perceptions of that crop. Mm -hmm. um, in in Malawi, for example, the word the word for for maize it means um, from our ancestors. Even though it came fairly late into a place like Malawi, where it replaced sorghum. Mm -hmm. Sorghum is not as productive as maize, and and farmers at each location, whether it's tropical, subtropical, um, or somewhat um, affected by the amount of moisture available by rainfall, by, by climate. Farmers adjusted to that. So you see the varieties of maize in all over the world ad adapted. And again, not so much like recent times by corporations who are who are uh, attempting to make maize science. Um, and that's the sort of dominant. The farmers made this choice every year when they selected their seeds. They would they would choose some of the some of the maize ears for seed and some for consumption. And the seed represented their sense of what they identified as the characteristics they wanted. And that includes the maize plant as forage for animals. Mm -hmm. So for example, in Italy, the, 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 the fact that, that, farm, that the peasant farmers were able to use the maize plant, not just the, the, the ear, but the plant itself to feed their cattle meant that they could keep the cattle in the barns on their farm and not send them into the mountains in the winter. And what they get from that is distinctive kinds of products of the animals who are eating the maize, such as Parmesan, such as Gorgonzola. The cheeses Italians, Italy is so well known for is part of the product of maize as, at the core feeding of the animals so they can be kept in the barns and fed over the course of the winter and thus store, storing the, the milk in the form of cheese. So it's not that uh, maize uh, only 
uh, I mean, grows well or produces uh, good yield, good yields in specific climates. I mean, different kinds of maize have been adapted to different sorts of uh, climates and environments. Yeah, well, with the restrictions on maize or the, the constraints that farmers would respect would would, would um, develop is maize is is vulnerable to drought. Okay, it's moisture sensitive. So okay. if you if you have a, a drought prone area, either seasonally or within a year, you have to realize that maize is vulnerable to to moisture to moisture uh, availability. The other is maize tends does not store as long as other crop crops. Millets store for a very long time. Ethiopian crop F will will store for years. Maize you get four months. Maybe maximum six months, but unlikely. So you've got to eat it, move it, preserve it somehow. So it has those constraints on maize. And so that's why you don't see maize as a dominant crop everywhere. Okay. And when it comes, uh, we've, you've already mentioned some of that, but when it comes how and why it spread across the globe, apart from the traits you've already mentioned, were there any specific, for example, political or economic reasons for it to become so widespread? Uh, uh, well, yes. One, it's here's an example, and this is not from the Africa work I did, but the work I've done in Italy, mm -hmm. where the key crop for the Veneto, Venice was an empire, an empire of trade, mm -hmm. but they, the 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 Venetian patricians. The rich folks in Venice itself told the farmers on the terra firma, uh, who they controlled, that you will pay your taxes in wheat. And the farmers said, wheat doesn't work well here in northern northern Italy. Wheat works in southern Italy and elsewhere. So we want to start paying our taxes in maize. And at first, the patricians in Venice said, no, we want wheat and we control you. So mm -hmm. the battle eventually was won by the peasants in the terra firma and because of the, the 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 plague and other kinds of situations, they won the day and were allowed to pay their taxes in maize. Mm -hmm. And of course, maize then becomes the basis for the diet in northern Italy of polenta. Mm -hmm. Rather than pasta, it's an importation from southern Italy. Mm -hmm. And the same thing happens where maize is introduced in uh, in Africa, where f farmers find it help help important to adapt maize as their fundamental crop. But one of the liabilities of maize is it has insufficient amino acids. Mm. So you have the problem pellagra, is disease that you find, especially in agricultural societies in southern the American South, in Italy, and any and in southern Africa, any place you have a dominance of maize in the diet that came as part of of maize being a po really popular crop for farmers to grow is pellagra is a skin disease. And you find it places where the diet becomes too dependent on maize. But you don't find that in Mesoamerica because in Mesoamerica, they process maize using lyes and change the chemistry so that you get a complete uh, amino acid and complete protein by having a maize-based diet. It has to do with processing. How do you process the maize? But they didn't do that in... Um, in other places, Italy, Africa, the southern U.S., where mm -hmm. pellagra becomes a serious problem until it's understood that you have to complete the proteins by, by research in the early 20th century. And when exactly did maize get to Africa? Well, we don't, of course, completely know, but we can look at um, places early on where we begin to get adaptation, for example, a, a, the names given to maize, you mm -hmm. find in places in Nigeria or West Africa that the, the words for a maize tell us something. The the um, the Akan in, in Ghana, uh, the word for, for, for maize means something from the foreigners. Mm -hmm. In Ethiopia, the, one of the words for maize was Yibahar Mashila. In other words, the sorghum from across the ocean. It looks maize looks like sor sor sorghum, or sorghum looks like maize when it's growing early on. Mm 
but that the factor of people recognizing saying it's the sorghum from across the sea. And now when you go to to the place of it within Ethiopia, I work, it's just called Mashila, which just means sorghum. But it's not sorghum. The people understand that the word tells you people's perceptions of when this arrived. Uh, so exact dates, by the time the Portuguese arrive in Ethiopia, they're finding some maize there and they tell us what they're growing. And you can see the maize has already arrived, but we don't have a clear historical record because that's something that takes place at the basic level of human subsistence and doesn't make it into the historical sources quite as clearly as it does later on. And how does maize tie to Africa's Green Revolution? Well, the Green Revolution originally was done with rice for South Asia, so, mm -hmm. so for India, South Asia. And mm -hmm. so that, that revolution was about doing short, short, uh, that you have to have you have to have water and you have to have fertilizer and you get a huge growth in food production yeah. in South Asia. For Africa, the 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 attempt has been to say yes, maize is going to be for Africa, like rice was for South Asia, and that's done by has been done by corporations, by USAID, international organizations. Um, the key center for research on maize is in Mexico City. Okay. And when I visited there, uh, I was taken to, uh, there was an Ethiopian there who I, got, I work in Ethiopia, so we became friends. He took me to a rural site outside of Mexico City. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were growing their maize, the seed for which was going to be introduced to Ethiopia. Uh, so the international nature of the research going on now, the Green Revolution, the idea was maize can be the center point of that for Africa but with the problems that maize has about storability and about incomplete proteins. And so what he, this Ethiopian scientist was doing was developing a new variety with complete um, proteins. So it would have to be identified as having a market value. You pay more for those seeds to have complete proteins. And this, this uh, type of maize uh, was also introduced elsewhere in Africa it's part of what people hoped would be a green a kind of green revolution, and it has done that. The improvement in the the yield of the maize, the improved maize, is substantial, to um, six to eight tons per hectare, compared to two tons per hectare in local varieties. So that is Africa was has been seen as the key to that. In many ways, it is, although. Mm -hmm. For example, Ethiopian restaurants are very popular in around the world, but in, mm -hmm. in the U.S. and in, in Europe. And you will not find maize, even though it's the number one crop in Ethiopia, you will not find maize on the diet of Ethiopia, the menu of Ethiopian restaurants, because it's not traditionally their ideal food. It's a food of poverty. Um, you can buy ears of maize on the street, roasted maize on the street, very inexpensive. But as a as a Fund, fund, fundamental part of diet, problematic. And why is it that uh, when it comes to Africa, people decided on maize? I mean, why wasn't it some other crop? Well, they have, you can, you can look at each individual situation. The place I work in Ethiopia, mm -hmm. they had a full, maize came very late. It was there as a garden crop. Okay. Early yielding, it's the first crop of the year. If you have it in your, your household garden, um, you get the first milky stage. You, you can eat milky stage maize or wait wait till it dries and then process it. But it's the first crop you're going to get. Uh, but they, there they had other crops. They had teff and wheat and barley. And it was a very, very diversified cropping system the farmers understood well. In other places, places in Southern Africa, for example, it arrived, it replaced sorghum because it was much more productive. And the African farmers all over Southern Africa said, this thing will give us a yield quickly and it is a food that we can adapt into our diet. So sorghum has almost disappeared. And maize is the crop that, that has many different varieties in all the countries of Southern Africa, all different names. Basically, it's what Americans would call, would call grits or Italians would call polenta. Uh, so maize in its various forms 
re reflects the, the choice of farmers to say this thing gives an early yield, but the new varieties, the Green Revolution varieties, yield much later. Mm -hmm. And you don't eat them at the mil milky stage, at the green stage. You have you have to wait and dry them and then process them. So it feeds into the industrialization of, of mills that began to change the way that the market affected what kind of maize farmers were growing. And the government would say, okay, you may, may grow only this kind of maize because we cannot sell colored maize. Colored mm -hmm. maize drops out of the market because the international markets say, we want white maize. And if yellow maize is grown, yellow maize is useful for poultry. Who likes white yolks in their eggs? The yellow comes from the beta carotene in the yellow maize. Hmm. So you have these adaptations where the millers are saying, we want this kind of maize because that's the one we can sell into international markets. And so you have, for Africa, virtually all of the African maize is white. In the US, maize is for livestock. And you want your your the fat of your livestock to be kind of a little bit yellow. So mm -hmm. the, the yellow maize is dominant in North America and in Europe too. White maize is still there. You can buy polenta either white or red, depending on your taste, what you're eating the polenta with, with, with fish, or with uh, with with the tomato sauce, etc. So these are consumer preferences that reflect the larger market preferences of the kind of maize that farmers are going to be growing to produce commercially for the market. So uh, politics and economics also certainly play the big role in the adoption and spread of maize across Africa, correct? Yes. So if you look at a place like Zimbabwe, which did fantastic research on maize development, mm -hmm. the law system eventually through the 20th century said, OK, you may not grow maize, which is not white. Mm -hmm. uh, because white is the international market and we're producing the, some of the best hybrid maize developed through research came out not out of the North America, but out of Rhodesia, southern Rhodesia, which became Zimbabwe. Because the, the 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 maize the scientists there the white the white Rhodesian scientists developed a incredibly productive uh, variety, but for that variety of of really um, productive maize in terms of of, a, of the economic perspective, that you had to have just the right soils, just the right moisture, just the right seasonal conditions, and of course the white population in southern Rhodesia controlled those things. And the, the black farmers were not given access to this new these new varieties. Incredibly productive in, yeah. from a scientific point of view, economic point of view. But you also found, and this is a story I got when I was doing work, work in Zimbabwe, one of those scientists showed me a chart he made. He said, chart showed, wait a second, why are suddenly this, this production going up that we're not we're not charting. He said, in his own handwriting, he wrote on this little chart from the 1960s. He showed me this chart when I interviewed him. He wrote African farmers. In other words, African farmers had found the, the, the new crop, the new variety, and were using it mm -hmm. and adapting it in their own terms, even though the government was trying to suppress their their role in production of, of, of maize. Very, very, very political, economic, in a fascinating way, which is what led me into, and what led me into, you didn't ask this question, but I'll answer it anyway. How did I begin to understand and want to explore more of the role of maize? Because I grew up with maize fields all around me as a kid. I grew up in Illinois, and Illinois is a big maize producing area. But when I was interviewing farmers in Ethiopia after the famine, uh, there was a socialist government in place that was trying to control farmer activities. And farmers were growing their different varieties of crops. And then suddenly, when I said, okay, what did you grow last year, the year before that, the year before that, they were saying, well, this, this, then maize, 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 maize. Really? I said, maize is drought, is drought um, affected. Um, it, it, it is not the best nutrition in the world. It doesn't fit your normal diet. Why are you doing this? 
And so I began to understand it's because the government's saying, we don't care what you grow as long as you pay in these other crops. Hmm. And they said that maize was safe because the government wouldn't take it from them. It was a political decision that, that affected what farmers did. Right. And uh, I mean, going along the, uh, that line of thought, uh, I would also like to ask you a little bit about the particular case of South Africa, which you have done some work on. Uh, you mentioned science there, for example, and I asked you about politics. But in the particular case of South Africa, uh, in what ways did politics, science and race intermingle there? Well, for Southern Africa, we you know the politics we know of the the arrival of Europeans in the 17th century and then the spread from the Cape into colonial settings that were originally the the arrival of uh, Dutch. Later on, the, the the British Empire incorporated that, mm -hmm. but the basic population still was agricultural, um, and they of course had needs for the mines. So the Southern African economies were about gold first, sorry, diamonds first, then gold, and that became the dominant effect. So what do you need? You need labor. Mm -hmm. And when the labor is the black population, which needs to be fed, and right. the, the mine owners were having to determine what do we feed our mine workers to keep them healthy enough to work. Mm -hmm. And maize became the key crop for them uh, and the, the word uh, mili, milipop is the South African word for polenta or for the basic maize, which comes from the Portuguese mili. So mili was not maize, but the word came to include maize from the original Portuguese. And so you have this phenomenon of the mine economy creating a sense of what is what is good food. Um, and eventually the population came to define their full bellies is the feeling you get when you've eaten a big batch of maize. And when that becomes a kind of a cultural norm of what feeling full is, uh, maize becomes that key ingredient. So the, the miners also went back to their family farms when they rotated out of the mines and they began to grow maize as the dominant crop and that was women doing the work back home where men were the winers earning wages. And the, therefore, the, the core diet became maize because it was low labor, lower labor, something I didn't mention. Maize takes less labor, you can broadcast it. Uh, you don't have to do it by row, et cetera. Uh, so its characteristics meant it could be adapted on small farms in which women's labor was the key issue. So Southern Africa, it was about mining the economy and eventually became the accepted um, diet was maize was the core of any meal mm -hmm. yes there was sorghum a little bit here and there you can still buy some sorghum in south african uh, gross groceries but for the most part the basic diet is maize white maize mm -hmm. right and do we know if uh, maize has had uh, any impact on the biodiversity of Africa? Well, in some ways, it's a negative effect because the farmer incentives with political context in many cases is maize is the crop that's early yielding. It gives a very good yield for small farmers and you go to you know, six to eight tons per hectare of the new varieties. So farmers are seeking both the commercial value of that to, to send it to the, to the cities, but also it is very, very attractive as the local diet. Um, so the biodiversity, pushing maize as, as USAID does with the AGRA, the, 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 this big development program, mm -hmm. based upon maize as the primary crop. Um, and so you have corporations, Mons Monsanto, mm -hmm. and of course maize production Monsanto is now owned by Bayer. So the big maize producers are all owned by drug companies, by chemical companies. DuPont owns all of those, those early developers of, of maize in North America, in Europe, are all owned by now chemical drug companies, DuPont, Bayer, um, 
can go down the line. So it, beca it becomes a corporate crop and farmers are, are dealing with markets and their own food supply, depending on where you are in Africa. Maize is not the dominant crop in every part of Africa. It is in, it is in Southern Africa. It is in Kenya, Tanzania. Ugali is essentially grits, polenta, right. but for, for East Africa. And that's, I had a friend, a Ugandan friend who came to Ethiopia and she was dying to have ugali in her diet because she's from Uganda and for her food meant maize. At that point, Ethiopian restaurant, Ethiopian national diet did not really include maize for the middle and upper class. So maize has this fun little role. It's not a friend of biodiversity. Mm -hmm. And uh, a related question, do we know what impact uh, the introduction of maize had on African people's nutrition and health? Well, I mentioned pellagra, right. too much dependent on maize. But maize has its place because it yields early. Depending on the variety you're growing, you can be you can be the first thing that comes after the first crop. And you have we have often Af African cultures have celebrations of the first crop. The, mm -hmm. the new year begins. The yeah. first thing you can get is maize, because you can eat it at the milky stage. As we eat with with, uh, we haven't mentioned there are five varieties of maize. One of which is sweet corn, uh, which is the one you eat at the milky stage. It's wonderful, delicious. Um, something in the fall when the first maize comes in, you want to have uh, sweet corn. There's also popcorn, also dent corn, also flint corn. These are both flint corns, which has the character of storing longer, right. uh, which is a good thing, but they may take longer to mature and you're not, you're not consuming them at the early stage. So the, the, the role of maize in the diet differs on which kind of cuisines you're talking about, which parts of Africa. And Africa, of course, is a wonderfully diverse place, linguistically, culturally, in terms of diet. And maize plays an important part in a number of different African diets. Mm -hmm. So for the second part of the interview, let's say I would like to ask you a few more general questions, not specifically related to maize itself. So uh, particularly when I asked you about Southern Africa and also earlier in the interview, you mentioned a little bit of it. Uh, we talked about colonialism. So uh, what would you say was the role played by colonialism when it comes to spreading crops across the globe? And uh, how was the adoption of different crops influenced by it? Well, it depends on the situation. We have an example of Ethiopia where there was not formal colonialism. The, the Italian period was only a few years. Mm -hmm. So the adaptation was done essentially by farmers themselves taking advantage of what is available to them in terms mm -hmm. of their own strategies of cropping across a year and feeding their community with a little mm -hmm. bit of commercial sale, selling of, of grains, but also the household level. When you go to a place like Southern Africa, or, or so, Southern Africa, you have a large uh, ar arrival of a European population who mm -hmm. are originally Dutch and then English, and then some Portuguese and different, different groups arrive there, Europeans who control things, who are interested in feeding their labor and feeding themselves so you have in South Africa a wonderful um, tradition now of wine because some of the early migrants out of Europe were Huguenots. The Huguenots were escaping France because they were oppressed by the Catholic majority there. And they began importing uh, vineyards. And that became now today some of the best places to go in, on wine tours in the world, in my experience. South Africa is fantastic. Um, and that links to the minefields needed labor. The, so mm -hmm. the, minefields, the vineyards needed labor. And those laborers were eating increasingly maize, <laughs> getting back to maize. But it was, in some places, there was not a European population. In East Africa, Kenya, a little bit Tanzania, you had European populations that were affecting what farmers were doing 
because they're expected that farmers would grow crops consumed by Europeans. Uh, West Africa, the conditions of malaria, something else I work on, malaria meant that Europeans in large populations did not populate West Africa. They would tend to populate, as in, in, um, in India, hill stations that were free from malaria, so Europeans would c- control those spaces. Mm-hmm. And so the population was allowed to keep um, local varieties of foodstuffs. So, for example, in West Africa, you had the possibility of, of uh, maize could be there as a first crop if you're clearing your forest. But the, the crops you really want to have in there are yam, cassava, another new, manioc, another new world crop. Uh, yeah. If you, you know bubble tea? Uh, yes. The bubbles are manioc. It was a cassava. Oh. oh. New world. Okay. Uh, so you have these the mixes, sometimes called the Columbian exchange of crops coming from the old new world to the old world. I call it the I call it not the exchange, but the circulation, because the food crops, along with peoples, are circulating and bringing their preferred foods with them. So in West Africa, you have forest crops, you know, yams that are, that are grown in the in the in, um, in the forest floor. Uh, mm-hmm. Maize is there for the first crop, but then people want to get into yams and, and cassava mm-hmm. and other kinds of crops taken from the forest, the biodiversity of the forest. Now, all mm-hmm. of that's changing, of course, as cities grow. But the colonial effect is greatest in some places where there could be new neo-Europe's, such as Southern Africa, Kenya. But where there's factors of disease that African populations had resistance to, mm-hmm. uh, the Europeans would tend to avoid those areas, control them for produce, production of food and for mining, et cetera. Right. But uh, maize there was, it's, it's, its interest came from farmers themselves, but also because Europeans were happy to have those workers under, under colonial rule fed. And the maize then became a key part of that process of nutrition. Mm-hmm. So, uh, in the historical scholarship, one approach that people have is to look at the causal relationship between climate and history. Uh, what do you think of it? Climate is fundamental to history. Mm-hmm. Climate about seasonality. What is the, the annual cycle of of availability of moisture? Uh, disease is also se- seasonal, affected by climate, by issues of climate. It's the thing I'm working on now is a sort of the more fundamental issue is about water. Water, its presence, its absence, its movement, its movement through the seasons, and this is deeply within the issue of climate change. Climate change, availability of water, but of course, just look at t- today's stuff in in Ukraine. Or what do you do when you want to defeat your enemy? This is what the Germans did in Italy in World War II. They said, we're going to stop the Allied invasion in Italy by flooding the farmers' fields because then that will encourage malaria, which will affect the invading army. In this case, the British-American uh, invasion of, of Italy. Right. And that was a specific military plan. What's going on now, even though we're not quite identifying the source of it, this is what the Russians are doing. They said, we're going to blow up this dam and we're going to flood this entire area to impede the movement of, of, of military activities. And this gets back to the seasons in which empires within Africa, within Ethiopia, for example, the, the, the armies moved only during the dry season. If you move during the wet season, then the areas would be malarial. Uh, so the seasonality of when moisture is available is a big deal militarily, in terms of the production of food, in terms of, you know, if you if you look at people who are traveling, describing events in Africa, or the conditions in Africa, Europeans writing down what they're what they're encountering, they only travel during the dry season. They're only giving a partial view of what they're seeing, because they wouldn't go during the wet season, because it's one, it's muddy, two, it's mal- malarial, and the f- local merchants and, and uh, moving around are only doing their movement during that seasonality. It's the seasons change different parts of Africa, but it's that seasonal change and the, and the the issue of climate change, which is now having major effects. 
Right. Uh, so I would like to ask you one last question slash topic. So, uh, of course, when it comes to history, um, I would like to ask you, what do you think of approaches by people like Jared Diamond when it comes to explaining why certain societies became more successful than others and what we could call, or at least some people call, uh, geographical determinism? Well, that's always a, been a factor of how much is the, are the conditions deterministic. And Jared Diamond lays out an argument that's interesting to challenge, and it's good that it's there. But it's 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 an attempt at the universal explanation of human movement, human political economic domination, based around on environmental issues. To some degree, that's true, um, and I think that that any consideration of politics or of economic change or of interaction between different kinds of political systems. Uh, has its foundations in environmental, issue, in, in environmental issues. The fact that Europeans coming to Africa or even to North America or to, to the New World, it's about the movement of knowledge. Part of that Colombian circulation I mentioned was the arrival in Latin America of people who knew how to deal with tropical climates. The people, the, the, the selection of who is most valued as labor mm -hmm. out of the slave trade going to the to the carolinas in the u.s because the ones who were most valued came from senegambia they knew how to grow rice mm -hmm. and the, the plantation owners in in in, um, in the carolinas were stayed in their their uplands and in areas that were not so much so affected by malaria or other diseases and their their african slaves were allowed to move into the swampy areas because they knew how to grow um, glabrima rice. They were adapting the environment. They knew they knew how to deal with health, knew how to deal with production. And so the knowledge that moved into the new world also was a key part of this whole exchange. And mm -hmm. politics got into who, who controlled who, but also adaptations to environmental issues. If you mm -hmm. want to understand the geography of Ethiopia, as a, as a place, that's a place I work most. Right. You know, look at climate, seasonality, and you see that people would move in and out of areas that were affected by malaria or where they could grow one crop or another crop and then harvest it and get back to a safer area. Big factor. And Jerry Diamond, it's helpful to have that, that, um, that perspective mm -hmm. that is environmental determinism but it will have nuance by local areas. And that's the beautiful part of doing the doing the work and working with different people in different places. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, uh, I mean, I've also asked you about that because, of course, a big part of Jer Diamond's argument is based on uh, crops. Also, of course, domesticated animals in certain specific latitudes in the world. Uh, and uh, since, of course, our interview has been focused so much on maize and we touched on some other crops as well, uh, I was wondering, I mean, to what extent you would think um, the factors that Jer Diamond points to, uh, I, I mean, what, uh, how much of a role do you think they would play in human history? Well, I would add to Jared Diamond as, as a um, kind of marker of environmental determinism uh, mm -hmm. with a reasonable, coherent, and somewhat persuasive argument. But look at Alfred Crosby, who mm -hmm. coined the term the Columbian Exchange that I modified mm -hmm. to Columbian, uh, the interaction, um, is, is that uh, Alfred Crosby talks about the, the biological imperialism because the, the arrival in the new world of cattle and mm -hmm. pigs yeah. and, and chickens and part of this global circulation transforms the, the physical environment. When you release hogs into the environment, they're extremely good at going feral. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they change the physical world they live in. And humans are both either hunting them or trying to domesticate them or 
the, the animals and the plants, of course, maize being a big one of globalization. But this is also true of other other crops and other kinds of animals. Um, you know, goats, sheep, cattle, horses, mm -hmm. all of these things that transform the worlds they they move to, and the adaptation of local populations quickly to the horse, for example. You know, Native Americans in North America, adaptations of the horse suddenly they become mobile. Suddenly they're, they're able to hunt in different ways. Suddenly they're able to 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 expand their own local local control over different com competing groups in in new ways. So the the Alfred Crosby approach to this, which has been adapted by people scholars from from all over the world, are incorporating these ideas and and playing them out in local areas that make mm -hmm. sense for them. But Jared Diamond, more popular as, a, as something to read, uh, it's kind of New York Times bestseller list. But the Alfred Crosby stuff is also, uh, to me, uh, very good. And the co colleagues I work with who are specialists, mm -hmm. when I when I go someplace, it's not that I know things others don't know, but I absorb as a historian. I'm absorbing the knowledge and interacting with my colleagues, whether it's in Ghana. We were talking about the introduction of maize or in Ethiopia, where we're driving through the countryside and I'm saying, what's going on there? Or we're walking through the countryside and I'm always asking questions because right. they have the knowledge that I'm then trying to interpret for a larger uh, audience as an academic, as a historian. Mm -hmm. So these things are very, very global. It helps to have people kind of tweaking the narrative by publishing books like Jared Diamond. But it's not that we say, gee, he's got it right. Um, mm -hmm. He's, after all, you know, his original background. He's a gastroenterologist. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> He's a doctor. Right. And we trust doctors to a degree, yes. Yeah, right. So, uh, Dr. McCann, uh, I'm leaving a link to your book, Maze and Grace, A History of Africa's Encounter with the New World Crop, in the description box of the interview. Uh, would you like to mention any places on the internet where people can find your work? Well, I think the internet being what it is, you can you can do that. Um, what I'm getting now, I just was at Oxford University Press asked me to write a chapter on malaria in Africa. Mm -hmm. And malaria in, in Africa came from my own work with, again, with colleagues, um, who work on malaria in Africa and elsewhere. Yeah. But um, I got malaria when I was doing field work in Africa, uh, in, in Ethiopia, in mm -hmm. an area where the maize stuff was going on. And I didn't ask for malaria, but suddenly I had 105 degree fever and had to go back out of my, my rural area five hours by mule to get to mm -hmm. the nearest road, to the nearest light bulb. Oh my God. Uh, and so malaria became an interest and the maize malaria connection is one chapter of, of um, maize and grace. And so mal malaria is where I, I appear on the internet. I'm constantly getting notes saying, you've been cited by these hundred times. And I say, really? <laughs> I'm not doing, and it's, it's mainly now about the medical malaria stuff that links to the maize. All mm -hmm. these things are linked. Um, and now back to the more fundamental of water in which I'm doing a plenary panel for a international meeting in Finland next mm -hmm. year. And that is to draw people together around what is the meaning of water? Meanings of water as something physical, as something psychological, as something cultural. And mm -hmm. water takes us to all kinds of ways that people signify their sainthood if they're in a, in a uh, religious, religious setting. Um, for example, in the 1850s, this is a short story, the British traveler in Ethiopia came down with fever, and it's called Egu. He understood this as they have a fever, what do I do? He's riding around the countryside with people. And they said, what you need to do is stand under this tree, and we're going to dump water on your head. And this will deal with your fever. He said, well, first of all, it knocked him off his horse, knocked him senseless, and he felt slightly better at the end of this ordeal. <laughs> At the same time, there's someone in Malvern, England, who's going through a water therapy treatment, somewhat somewhat similar, and that person was Charles Darwin. So water is this this 
it's universal. Of course, it's universal, but the nuances in local cultures and local material versus belief systems is the thing that I'm working on now. And you find examples of that all over the world where suddenly climate that links to climate change. Very interesting. So, Dr. McCann, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you. So, we say buona notte or the Portuguese equivalent of the Italian. Yeah, in this case, uh, it would be boa tarde. Here, it's still the afternoons. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Time change, time change. So, yeah. Well, thank you very much, Ricardo. Very interesting. You're, you're, uh, you're, a, good, you're a good interviewer. Thank you. Hi guys, thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you liked it, please do not forget to like it, share, comment and subscribe. And if you like more generally what I'm doing, please consider supporting the show on Patreon or PayPal. You, get, you have all of the links in the description of this interview. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Perga Larsen, Jerry Muller, Hans Frederick Sunda, Bernardo Seixas, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Visser, Adam Castle, Matthew Whittingbur Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Eric Alenia, John Connors, Philip Force Connolly, Robert Windegger, Ruinacio, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Simon Columbus, Phil Cavana, Michael Stormir, Samuel Andreev, Francis Ford, Triago Duns, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Cusson, Hal Herzog, Nuno Machado, Jonathan Librand, John Linear, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, João Weira, Tam Amal, Sardis France, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Desarauzo, Romain Roach, Diego Londonio Correa, Yannick Punter, Adana Rusmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Stasevsky, Nelek Bach, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hallman, Sam Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paul Tolentino, João Barbosa, Julian Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Douglas Fry, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pans Cortez, Usla Litzke, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Sunny Smith, John Wiseman, Morten Eichland, Daniel Friedman, William Buckner, Paul George Arnaud, Luke Loaki, Giorgio Stéphanos, Chris Williamson, Peter Olozen, David Williams, Diogo Costa, Anton Eriksson, Charles Murray, Alex Shaw, Amory Martinez, Coralie Chevalier, Bangalore Atheists, Larry Dealey Jr., Holt Erickbun, Sterry, Michael Bailey, Dan Sperber, Robert Grassis, Tom Roth, the RPMD, Igor N., Jeff McMahon, Jake Zul, Barnabas Radix, Mark Campbell, Richard Bowen, Thomas Dobner, Luke Neeson, Chris Story, Manuel Oliveira, Kimberly Johnson, and Benjamin Galbart. A special thanks to my producers, these are Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Stafiniak, Tom Vanegdam, Bernard Hugni, Curtis Dixon, Benedict Mueller, Vega Gidi, Thomas Trumbull, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, John, John Carlo Montenegro, Robert Lewis and Al Nick Ortiz, and to my executive producers, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Quadrian and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all.